right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego and today I am delighted to be joined from Chicago, the windy city, although it's pretty windy here today. <laughs> San Diego, the windy city today. Stephanie Klein, how are you doing, Stephanie? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you, John. Glad to be here. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, poor Stephanie, there's a big snowstorm going on right now. But if there's one place that can handle snow, it's at places like Chicago. We know what to do with it. That's true. Yes. Um, and Stephanie is a three-time chief marketing officer in Fortune 500 uh, firms. And uh, she's the founder of uh, Mind Fire Mastery. And what we're going to talk about today is great subject is how disruption of our mindset, whether expected or unexpected, uh, or unintentional can help us build the resilience and perspective to shift to next level leadership and optimize our potential. So, um, Steffi, let's get straight into when you say a when you say a disruption of our mindset. Can you uh, just explain that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, let me give an example. <laughs> um, the the pandemic. The pandemic, um, we basically, before the pandemic, I know I'd worked in corporate America and we were, uh, you know, basically doing a lot of testing to see how remote work would work. Would it be productive? You know, could we really um, get away with people really not being face to face in person in business? And, you know, wow, we needed a, a, a disruption of our of mindset in order to realize very quickly that indeed productivity does not suffer. You know, other things do, right? It's relationships may, you know, but it certainly works. And the pandemic was a huge disruptor for us all globally. We're on a dime. Businesses shifted, educational institutions shifted, you know, everybody had to shift in some way. That is disruption of our mindset. And, you know, th this topic that really is near and dear to my heart um, really came to me from the fact that I was one of these high achiever controllers, which I'm sure a lot of your viewers are as, you know, leaders in sales and marketing. Uh, and, you know, it, it had worked out for me. You know, I was a good student. I got good jobs. I rose, you know, as you said, I rose the corporate ladder. I got to the C-suite. Um, now, certainly there were bumps along the way, but ultimately I felt like I could control things, right? That it was up to me um, to really work harder, do more, and it would all turn out the way I wanted it to. Disruption is us realizing, no, no, <laughs> you know, as my mom used to say, man plans and God laughs, you know, <laughs> it, it, we think we control it all, but we really don't. And so that's when we get stressed, when we really hold on to what we want it to be, but it really isn't happening. Yeah, and I, so, I was, I, I was, yeah. Stephanie, I always love that uh, Jack Walsh, uh, Jack Welch rather quote where he says like, face reality as it is, not as it was or as, as you would like it to be. Yeah, that's a great quote too. That, that's really it because when we don't do that, then, you know, we, we work harder, we keep pushing, it's hard. Uh, there's not enough hours in the day, mm -hmm. right? And so, and we've seen a lot of that. And so whether it's the pandemic, maybe a shift in your job, you know, I've gone through transformative acquisitions. I'm a survivor of breast cancer. I mean, stuff happens, right? And so we, these things help us see that disruption happens. And what I've really been working towards is not only having people be able to deal better with the disruption that happens that we can't control, John, but how do you intentionally get better at disruption so that you can disrupt yourself on your own timetable and really then, you know, the world is your oyster. Yeah, no, I love I love what you're saying there because uh, I, I always measure it in, uh, you know, I'm originally from Ireland and I came to the US during the dot-com era, right? So I came to <clears throat> Silicon Valley and so since I've been in America, been through the dot-com implosion, 9-11, um, financial crisis, COVID. And to your point is, we think we can, we, you know, we, we strive to try and control things, but like these huge disruptive events are coming along at pretty frequent intervals, not to mention the, the other smaller, you know, which may be bigger for you personally, but you know, right. not global. Um, <clears throat> events that come along and disrupt your life and it always seems that we're at odds especially at work right because we come to work and then we try to control everything we try to put everything in neat boxes and demarcation and all of that and that's just not the way the world works but for some reason when we cross the, cross the threshold of work we think we can impose control 
Yeah, that that's absolutely right. And and I think you know you know in all fairness. Uh, the systems, the corporations, the world, certainly in the Western world, <laughs> it all supports that notion, right? And so a lot of what I teach is that, you know, we're, we're moving along kind of on autopilot, you know, our brains actually 52% of the time they're wandering. That just is what we do. We used to scan the environment way back when to keep ourselves alive and see if there were bears or tigers around the corner. And we still do, but, you know, if we're in resting mode, we're really, our brains are moving, which is no longer needed to the same degree. So that to the extent we can really learn to quiet down that brain, to focus, to calm ourselves, that's when we really can dial up um, better decisions, uh, clarity, innovation, you know, and really connect more deeply to people, all of which is going to help businesses thrive. People thrive and then businesses thrive. So uh, it's a lot, it's unlearning a bit of what we've been wired to do. Yeah. yeah, although <clears throat> although if there were saber tooth tigers around right now, they'd be having a field day because <clears throat> people are walking along looking at their phones. It'd be like yeah, that's true. Fish in a barrel for them, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be fish in a barrel. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, but it's a great, but it is it, it it is a great point, and I think that's and I think if there's one thing I hope the pandemic has has contributed in a positive way is maybe it's forced people to spend a little more time with themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and to actually, as you said, quiet, take all the noise away and be, think, think and be with yourself because that's something that people seem to have gotten into the habit of avoiding because we live in this culture now of our devices are screaming at us the whole time. There's something I could do to just to make sure that I never have to think for myself. And I think that reflection piece is so critical. It is, it is. And you're absolutely right. These devices, which connect us in a way, right? They also interrupt us. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, they're showing us things that aren't even real around the world in terms of, you know, people posting on social profiles and so forth, which can lead you to feeling worse about yourself and your own situation. We also have, speaking of things that we're wired for, one of the things we're wired for is a negativity bias too. Mm -hmm. So when something bad happens to us, or let's say we hear bad news in the media, it really affects us and it stays with us. Positive things are like, you know, um, Teflon. They'll just, they just fall away from us. And the, and the negative is like Velcro that sticks to us. And, and it's not a one for one thing. So if something bad happens that we hear or that we experience, we actually need five positive things to counteract it. Mm -hmm. So that's just, that's just one little tip that is really important because like you said, these devices, sometimes you, you, you don't expect it, but all of a sudden you get a ping and something, you know, um, annoying has come through and you're about to go into an interview <laughs> on sales pop, you know, how do you, and then how do you deal with that? You really need to be able to sort of know about that little formula and really quiet yourself and bring in positive things, whether it's a cup of coffee or a good memory, you know, and really work to counteract that. And again, that can really help us when, when we're back to this even keel, we can really perform at our best. And that's really what a um, what so many professionals need to do, and particularly in sales and marketing, where it is about really tapping into what others need and really listening and really being able to, you know, blossom from there. Yeah, and and, and uh, I, I think it is incredibly important, uh, as you said, about the inputs. So you know whether, as you say, if if you focus on positive things when you've got something coming up, I mean that's obviously going to be far more healthy. You know, and rather than focusing on, you know, getting on your social media and, you know, getting caught up in comparison culture where you're like, ooh, ooh Stephanie's got more than I do. Now I'm all upset. Um, and, and maybe Stephanie does and maybe Stephanie doesn't. Maybe you're just really good at taking pictures that make it look like you're really. <laughs> exactly. And, hey, and that's what I mean. But but in the meantime, now I have just co-opted that and I've put myself in a bad frame of mind for for a time when I should have a positive frame of mind. And I think that's key stephanie is i don't think people sometimes realize how much power they have over their minds yeah I, you're you're absolutely right um when i was growing up it was conventional science that we were fully braked our brains were formed and we were fully set in our 20s and so it, you know it was what it was <laughs> and cutting edge neuroscience has shown us that this concept of neuroplasticity uh it just it, it really excites me because it shows us that at any stage of the game, but you know we can basically what we pay attention to, uh, what we think, do, and pay attention to changes us. It, cha it creates these new neural pathways, and these neurons that wire together, fire together, wire together. 
it, it all goes together. So when we start to do new things, kind of like skiing down a pathway, I'm seeing snow everywhere. So <laughs> let's just go with that analogy. You know, you're skiing down a mountain in fresh powder. It's, it's, it can be really hard when, you know, it's, there's no, there's no pathway. And then when you go down over and over again, it starts to go, start to go faster and you start to really get a groove. You really start to do that by this repeated, um, going through those paths over and over again. So whatever we want, whether it's, you know, more positivity, compassion, um, focus, all we need to do is really do some practicing along those ways, kind of like lifting weights. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's a great point. And yeah, the, the neuroplasticity is so important because uh, quite frankly, if I'd have, if I'd have stopped developing in my twenties, I'd, I'd be in a very different place today. That's all I can say. Um, uh, but we're moving swiftly along from that. Uh, but but that's the the point is I think you, people have more control and now that we we have this you know this science that's coming through that people are starting to understand how you can actually you know continue to develop and and, and work your brain, but it does take it does take uh, intentionality right you have to be aware of things and be intentional in what you do and that and that is that's a tough thing. Yeah, it really is, and I think a lot of people think of disruption. As happening to us, and and in actuality, you know, in, in the book I'm writing, I, I talk about CEO level disruption, and you know, the C stands for core disruption, which comes from ourselves, and that's not something we're used to. But the other two, we are. So the E is for eruptions, you know, things like the pandemic, right, or a health crisis, or you know, it, it, things like that that just they happen, and we we must react, we must adapt because it is the new reality, the financial crisis that you mentioned, and I lived through as a new CMO. Um, these are just things we have to react to. The, the O is opportunistic. So that's, you know, you know, you get a phone call and it's a great new opportunity across the country and maybe you're going to relocate. I have a cousin moving from California to Florida, not excited about it, but it's with Disney and it's a wonderful opportunity, you know, so opportunistically he's going to shift. Yeah. Uh, and that's a little more excited about the tax situation when he gets there, but that's okay. Yeah, that's right. That's why a lot of people do go there. That's right. <laughs> So yeah, he may, he may end up there. We'll see for the longer term, but the, th these three, these three, the CEO disruption is, you know, two out, two thirds of it comes outside of us. Right. And so we're dealing with that because we have to, but the huge opportunity is this core disruption to say, what do I want? You know, I was, I went through a transformative uh, acquisition and I was this, I, you know, I was still the reigning CEO memo at the end of it. My team grew, uh, my compensation was really strong, but there was a real shift in management and in culture and it did not fit with me anymore. And so I disrupted my life and myself and walked, you know, basically, uh, you know, amicably walked away, but I left. Uh, and went down a new path. And that is, you know, that's some, that's some CEO level disruption uh, to, to, to do that. And you can do this in small ways uh, all the time. But I, I think a lot of people with the great resignation we're seeing right now, right? People are starting to wake up and say, yeah, I've been disrupted from the outside. I want to take some control and I want to do this at a core level now. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I totally agree with you. And, uh, and I think if, uh, and, I, and I trace some of this also, you know, the great resignation, I trace some of this back to the financial crisis, because I think that was <clears throat> one of the first times that people really took a step back and said, okay, so I've located myself in a high cost area with a big mortgage, and a horrible commute uh, into just to be near this corporation that I work for. And guess what happens when there's a crisis? Oh, I get laid off. Now I'm stuck with a high cost of mortgage and a plate, blah, 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 all of that stuff. And so I think people started and now with the, the great resignation, people are more like more um, sort of deciding I'm going to live where I want. I'm going to find the place I want to live. I want to find the lifestyle I want to live and then I'll find the job. And to your point, if you as an organization aren't adapting to this, and saying, OK, I need to construct a new way of working. Maybe it's a hybrid. Uh, maybe we go totally virtual. Maybe it's a hybrid business, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Maybe we have some employees, a lot of contractors. Mm -hmm. But the nature of, the, of organizations is changing. And I think that's to your point is if you want to get ahead of the curve and be and be creatively destructive, that's where you need to go now. That's absolutely true. And uh, you said it very, very well. And as you were talking, I was I was reminded because you were saying what happened what happened after the financial crisis you know it's amazing if people were able to exercise choice and decide what they wanted to do next i'm a cautionary tale for what happens when you 
don't listen to yourself, right? And you keep going on and I kept working hard and all of a sudden I had breast cancer, you know? So it takes its toll on you. And that, it took its toll on my body, the stress, the, you know, 24 seven working, it just did. And I, and, and that's what happened to me in a company that can show up in terms of people leaving, right? Or morale being down, lack of engagement. So these things, bad things happen if we don't do it, you know? And so it really is important to sort of wake up and pay attention to what's really going on underneath. Because if you don't, uh, you know, it's gonna basically explode at some point in some way. Um, and then you have less control than even before. Yeah, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and I mean, on that, even on a personal level, like, you know, what, what you went through, how much of how important was your mindset to that? Because I mean, I'm a big believer in mind body um, from a medicine and health point of view. And I think it's often overlooked. You know, you go to one doctor for your physical stuff and then you go to another doctor for your mental stuff, but they're both in interconnected. So, you know, just on a personal level, how much was mindset critical to your recovery? It was it was so critical, John. Uh, I actually, when I was when I was younger, I had some jaw problems and I learned how to do biofeedback. So really using my mind to, to try to, you know, move my body in different ways. Right. And actually uh, athletes know this, right? Uh, Olympic athletes, a gymnast or any kind of athlete, they sort of picture what they're gonna be doing as they're doing it. They practice it in their mind. Um, and there, there was, before I get into my personal, uh, how I, you know, I visualized, there was actually a study at University of Chicago where they, they compared people who threw free throws for 30 days straight versus those that just thought about it and visualized it. And the results, there was a 23 and 24% improvement, basically the same over the course of 30 days by visualizing versus doing. So what I did was, you know, I visualized actually after each chemo treatment and in between um, my, my body actually had a little, had a little head uh, kind of leader down there who was making sure that all the cancer cells were, were swept away and disappeared and were leaving. And that was something that I did very consciously throughout. And then I also created new habits because I thought whatever led to me getting to where I am, if I don't change on the back end, even if the doctors do a great job and, you know, help me through this, this protocol with surgery and radiation and chemo, if I don't change on the back end, why do I think that things are going to be different down the road? So I changed, you know, I, I always said to myself, I'm not somebody who really, you know, I don't go to a health club and, you know, work takes precedent. I don't really work out. No, I just changed that. And I said, I'm going to work out. And I started small, kind of like James Clear says in Atomic Habits. I started small, you know, I got a trainer at first. And then I said, I'm just going to do this three days a week. I work out every day now. I mean, in some way, I might just be 30 minutes of walking, sure. but taking care of my body, listening to my body has become integral to how I live and, be, and, and am now in the world. Yeah. yeah. And, and I just think that's incredibly important just for people in general to, to know that. And as you said, I mean, you started slowly. I interviewed uh, um, a great guy uh, a year or two ago, and he he said he at one time he was seriously overweight, lazy, didn't exercise, everything. And then one day he just said, I'm going to run a marathon. Right. <clears throat> and he was so far away from that. But what he did was he got up that he got up that day and he walked for five minutes. And the next day he walked for 10 minutes and the next day he walked for 10 minutes and ran for five minutes or whatever. And anyway, long story short, he's done marathons. But to your point, it's, uh, it's you know, start start small with baby steps. like Because I think sometimes people think that changing mindset or even it has to be some big dramatic event, but it's not, it's often just small incremental steps. Uh, you, you, you're spot on. Uh, that's a great story. I love hearing how, you know, how that led to the, to the marathon, but that's exactly right. You, you have to start somewhere. I talked to so many leaders about, you know, if you could spend 15 minutes a day and completely change your mindset, you know, would you? And they're like, do you have a pill? Like they, you know, they, they, because if it involves sitting and getting really still with yourself, I ha I've met with so much resistance to that. And it's really interesting because, you know, it really only, if you, I teach emotional intelligence courses. And one of the exercises I do is literally just three breaths, which helps people just shift in, in under two minutes, you know, and people really enjoy that. And they can kind of feel the difference right away. You know, I'll just share. It's like on the first breath, you just kind of, you know, take a breath in and out and just kind of like a throwaway breath. And on the second one, you really relax your body. Just let go. I, I hold tightness in my shoulders, you know, my back, you just let it go. And on the third breath, you breathe in and out and you just say, what's most important right now? Mm. And it's just a great thing to do, you know, and it's practical, accessible. You can take it anywhere with you right before a big meeting or whatever. This is just a baby step, right? 
And, and maybe if you like that, maybe, maybe you sit and you do a meditation for two minutes or five on inside timer, you know, and it builds and it builds when you start to feel the effects and over six weeks studies show your brain matter actually grows. And, you know, there's incredible benefits in terms of focus and clarity and so forth. When you start to feel that and see the benefits and realize how much happier you are, you know, it kind of feeds on itself. Right. And so I think starting small is great. You know, just do something you're going to do, because if you're not going to do it, it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. And then just from a, um, an organization point of view, like you said, is, I mean, now is the time to to look forward and to be disruptive. Um, it's funny. I worked I worked the, the company I went that brought me over to Silicon Valley was the executive team best crisis management team I've ever seen. Like when, you know, when things would blow up, they'd all fly in, they'd bring us all, we'd go, we'd fix everything. Everybody would be really happy. Go Never fixed the underlying problems though. They would never changed anything. And, you know, six months later, bring the, you know, get the band back together for another crisis thing. And I, and, and the reactive nature of it instead of instead of actually going and it's harder i mean to be honest in many ways just reacting to crises is a lot easier than actually preempting and disrupting yourself yeah you're absolutely right and it can be really hard it can be hard to do inside a company which i you know is often probably why they bring in consultants you know often you bring them in for really big changes because it really is hard to get it going from the inside and often people hire coaches or consult you know coaches to help them too because you need, you need a process, you need accountability, you know, it can be very hard on your own. And it really helps to kind of, uh, to have support when you're doing this. Disruption can be a tough, it's a tough one, but it's immensely rewarding, right? We're, what, what is the quote, um, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Mm -hmm. I think that's Einstein. Um, yeah, it's, which it is. <laughs> Yeah, no. And and what you just said about the crisis communications, it really is is true. You're just this band aid approach, right? You're not really getting to the um, underlying systems and how you kind of get ahead of it. Yeah. yeah. And just and I think in just yeah. in in the final one, I think uh, that you know the work world is changing, as we said, like even from an organizational point of view, but also from a skill set you know point of view, where there's a lot of very specific jobs or skills needed today and sometimes as i said sometimes they're not always needed full time so that's why great now you can get uh, contract workers from all over the world uh, and everything mm -hmm. but in order to work like that uh, as i said you have to have a different approach to how you're how you're organized and your mindset towards integrating people and teams and moving pieces in and out and then keeping it cohesive even when you may have people in the office people virtual people who are contractors but maybe long term so they feel like employees but they're not so mm -hmm. but I, I think all of that requires a a mind shift um, and mind shift and if you get ahead of it i think there's a huge potential for creative disruption if you're really creative about how you organize your organization going forward yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I do think there's uh, something to be said for empowering people more, you know, mm -hmm. and as leaders, really getting getting real with the talents of your people and really getting to know them and creating a safe environment. Google actually did a study showing that uh, the number one factor for the best teams, they looked internally first at themselves and used all their, you know, their whizzes and algorithms to figure out reverse engineer made the teams and it was psychological safety you know it wasn't the best manager a cheaper controller it was psychological safety so people could show up and be their best selves mm -hmm. and and i think when companies learn how to do that better when leaders start with themselves and then really create that that feeling of safety for their teams they're going to really elevate the productivity and the power of the teams and the organization and i, and I think it also is it will elevate innovation, right? Because you get more perspectives. You have people showing up and speaking up. You can't see everything at, you know, at, at the C level or at the at the senior level. So really that's a it's a huge opportunity. Yeah. And the days are gone when you can be the expert as well. Like yeah, you know, I mean you can't anymore. There's so many specific things. There's so many different and I think that's the biggest challenge for a lot of people in leadership. Maybe who've been in leadership for a long time, maybe new but that idea of I'm not the expert. I'm not the expert in everything, but my job is to find the people who are and to, as you say, empower them. But that's a different mindset. Well, it is. And if, and if the, if the soundtrack in your head is, I'm not the expert anymore, you know, that can feel like, 
Wow, demotion, victimization, right? That can be, that's, you can see why they're holding on and trying to protect and control. But if it's instead, it's, yeah, nobody is, <laughs> you know? And my biggest way to serve this company is by allowing everybody's brilliance to shine. Wow, that's a different soundtrack. And then you act differently. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Stephanie, this has been fantastic. And all of Stephanie's information is gonna be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your company. Oh, great. I'd love to. So uh, I am, after 30 years of, of being uh, in the marketing realm and at Fortune 500 companies, I now run a company called Mindfire Mastery. And our mission is to support high performance professionals to really use disruption as a superpower to help them reach higher potential. And importantly, to trade burnout and overwhelm for a balance and even more impact and happiness, because we can actually have those at the same time. So uh, I run, you know, mindfiremastery.com is my website. Um, if you if you go there and sign up for my newsletter, you will get a lot of juicy tidbits for me. If you send me an email, I'll give my email too, stephanie at mindfiremastery.com and you reference sales pop, I'll actually send you a one pager of some great resources that I personally use um, and put it together, especially for this audience. So happy to do that. And I'm launching a book later this year called Waking Up on the Right Side of Wrong, which I'm very excited about, which will kind of get into some of these themes and not just in a theoretical sense, but practically giving stories and then examples and exercises on how to um, move forward with uh, your optimal potential. Yeah, so. fantastic. I, I mean, I, I would encourage people to go check it out. I mean, everybody mindset is just so, so, so critical. And I think under, you know, as I said, I think in, it, too many people think that they don't have the power to change things, but they really do. Um, so yeah, go check out uh, Mindfire Mastery. And Stephanie, hopefully you'll come back when your book is published later this year. Oh, I'd love to, John. I'd love it. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, thanks again. Thanks, everybody, for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.